Yeah, my name is Thomas, and um, my daily work is incident response and forensics. Uh, I have done some red team. So in red team engagements, I often use uh, responder, where there's a function to set up a rogue proxy server with the WPAT function. So monitoring the network to see the traffic, seeing that clients is asking for the VPAT domain uh, in the company, but it is also sometimes asking for VPAT.tld. So who is having this domain? Is it in use? Is it free? Can I buy it? What are they using it for? So at the time I looked at this, I looked up and I discovered it was a German guy that had this uh, Danish domain. Uh, don't know what he was using it for. Two years later I looked again, discovered there's someone in Israel having the Danish domain. And in 2020, the Danish register for DK, DK domains added a function where you can sign up for a waiting list. So I signed up for a waiting list and paid a small fee every year. So how it's working, the basic is that a client goes to, for requesting a web page, it's going to the DNS server, finding the IP address, then go to the web server and, and getting the content back, very basic. If we are adding a proxy server into the mix, then the proxy server will do all the heavy lifting. So the client is asking the proxy server, the proxy server is, is doing the name resolving and getting the web page and returning the content to the end client. So back in 1996, Netscape decided that there must be an easier function for when you're adding a machine to a network to automatically configure the machine. So they come up with this uh, WPAT function to automatically ask for the machine where the configuration file is stored. Um, they set down a consortium to try to make an FC standard for it, but it never eclipsed so it expired in 1999. So it's 25 years uh, anniversary now. According to Wikipedia, the way it works is that you have the name where the client is uh, part of the domain. It will add VPAT in the front and slowly test until it finds a, a name where it matches and get a response and can download the configuration file. But in some implementations, it will go down to vpad.tld and then download the configuration file from there. And as you can see on the Wikipedia page here, it says that it's an uh, incorrect uh, solution and it shouldn't be used that way. So that's a security issue. So the way we at Repad is that we have a client, it's called client.a.company.com. Then it will search for Vpad when the browser is opened. It will then remove the client name and then try to add vpad.a.company.com and try to resolve that. If that's not working, it removes one name. So it's vpad.company.com. And in this example, it's resolving the IP address, and then it goes to a web server trying to download a file called vpad.dat. And that's the configuration file for the client. It can also be configured with other solutions like DHCP, Vince, and so on. So the dat file it downloads is actually a small JavaScript that the client execute on the client machine with uh, called find proxy for URL. It's input what URL it's trying to go to and the name. And then you can uh, modify this script to say that the client should go direct if it's company name addresses or it should go to a proxy server if it's all anything else on the internet, like this uh, proxy.company.tld.880. So here we have an example of where it's trying to go to defcon.org and it's not matching any of the if statements and then go to the proxy as the last uh, return statement. There's a website dedicated for all the functions that can be used in this limited, very limited uh, uh, JavaScript language. You cannot use all functions. Um, here you can see the top part of the functions. 
there's DNS domains resolved, is it in net and so on. But there's also some other functions that work, like I have found here the stable functions, I call them, with I can get user agent, host name, time zone, and so on. In the past, I could also from some clients get uh, screen resolution and color depth and, and so on from each client. But that's very unstable and many of the clients that crashes the JavaScript when trying to ask for that. So I've removed that. So when a VPAD is implemented, Ella is not implemented in a company and someone gets the top level domain, then what happens is that the client is asking for the VPAD in the company. It doesn't get any results. It tries again by removing one name and tries again by removing one name and ending on VPAD DK. So it goes to an external VPAD web server downloading a configuration file for the client how it should use proxy settings and trust that server even as it's not inside the company. In 1999, when it expired and Microsoft was part of this consortium, the same month Microsoft was informed that uh, there's a security issue. If someone buys this top level domain in TL with any TLD, you can basically own a complete country. So there has been talks about this before. In 2007 on KiwiCon, there was some guy uh, having an eight year anniversary for this issue, looking at the uh, things and had a very good talk. Unfortunately, it's not public anymore. And then a SmoothCon, same year, another guy had the look into this. And then Microsoft got busy again trying to make a new patch, trying to fix whatever that was found in 2007. So now it's fixed, right? It should be. So for me, the waiting time is over. In 2023, in March, I got a mail from the Danish registrar, Dico Hostmaster, saying that the vpad.dk domain was now mine and I could register it and assign it to a server. So I found a cheap web portal and added to a, a web server there just because I think I want to see if there's any traffic at all, uh, just monitor the logs and so on. At the same time, I looked at the, who has owned this domain in the past and I could see that from the talks in 2007, there was someone in Denmark deciding it was a good idea to have this domain for some years. But then he sold it and uh, one uh, guy in Belgium got the domain and one in Germany and then one in Israel and then I got it here last year. So this is the logs from the first day I assigned the VPAD to a web hotel. I was a bit surprised to get more than 80,000 requests of this VPAD.dat file on the first day basically. The spike in the graph, I think that's the rollover time from I started, that has to go 24 hours. That's why it's not linear. So basically 80,000 requests on the first day without doing anything other than buying a web hotel and adding the domain. <coughs> so that's not fun because I don't have access to all the log files. So the way was that I set up a VPS server, installed DNS server on it, become my own uh, name server on the internet, registered and DNSSEC and all the things, and added a web server on top of that. That way I could add the domains I got into this server and capture all the traffic, all the logs in the way I like to have them. And every good website should have a web page, right? So I took my best skills and opened Notepad and crafted a web page where I added some crap about you shouldn't use this page and uh, this is for research and so on. <coughs> so when the client is downloading this VPAD dat file, the JavaScript and executing it on the internal client machine, it cannot see the public IP that is coming out on when it's going onto the internet. So the way I fixed that was that I added on my web server a, a dynamic web page that builds the JavaScript for the client dynamically. So I add the client's public IP into the script before each client get the script. So they're getting a dedicated script for each client. So I have the public IP, even the client doesn't know it in the 
in by themselves on the internal network. So when a client one two three want to go to uh, the net, this is a simplified version of my scripts. But what is basically doing? I'm building a string in the DNS name with the information I take from the client, like the time zone, internal IP, external IP, and so on. So it, I can leak data to my DNS server uh, about the internal client. So in this example, you can see the client is told to go to defcon.org, and the D is the time zone, I, and then the internal IP, W is the world IP, public IP, and then it goes to p.vpad.dk as my server. And of course, I use port 80 because I want all the traffic to me unencrypted. So just come as normal HTTP unencrypted. So the, then the client, for every request they make on the machine, all URLs, they will pass it through this uh, web proxy scripts. And then it will go to this address that built automatically or dynamically for each request they're doing. So I get in my log files uh, listing of what traffic they are trying to resolve, and then I tell them to all the requests go to this web server. There's my web server on the same host, and then the client is asking my server for some web page, and I and I'm so kind, so I return errors for everything because I don't want to run a proxy server on the internet that is opened and be man in the middle, so I just return errors for everything. <clears throat> and yes, I get the, see the inside with HTTP clear text, but they think I'm asking on the outside at HTTPS. So for every request every client is making, I'm returning this error page. Um, and to be nice to the users, I have included an input form, so if they don't like what they're seeing, they can tell me what the hell is wrong and what I should do better. And there's also a checkbox for whitelisting the client, so they can input their, client, their host name and add the, click, the whitelist checkbox. But I haven't implemented that function, so this is first step on the form, right? <coughs> yeah, and just a disclaimer, I'm not intercepting any traffic. I'm just uh, looking at log files and so on from requests that's coming in. I haven't told any clients anywhere to contact my server. I only just bought one domain name, set up a web server, and all the clients is coming to my server. So this is an example of information I'm getting from one client. I can see the client's public IP, what name server it used, what internal IP address it has, the time zone, and then from, of course, from the web server log, I can see what they're asking for, and thereby also what, which user agent string they have, what application are they using, and operating system, and so on. So this was fun. That come get a lot of traffic into the server, um, more than I expected. So why not look for buying some more domains? Um, sadly, the three domains here, they are uh, protected, so you cannot register them. There's a limit on that. They have already set that up. But I got ID and site and build, just for fun. And why not looking at the list, there was press and porn. So we can try and see which one of them is the most popular one. And because we are here, Dot Vegas. And then I found that the uh, vpad.eu was apparently registered, but there was someone trying to sell the domain, but I'm not buying it at that price. So I could see that also rented the dom domain, so I asked them, can I rent this domain for one year? And is there any limits or rules for what I can use the domain for? And they say, no, you can, there's no rules, you can rent it for one year. And I paid three and a half euro per month for renting the domain. And then I politely returned it when I was done with it. <coughs> so this is my list of, of domains for this uh, research. And for one year, from April to April, I get 1.1 billion DNS requests resolving in 200 gigabyte sex log files. This is for the DNS server alone. And if you look down on the, I don't know how big it is, but 
there's a client asking for CNN.com and you can then see the, the internal IP and public IP and so on of the clients. So here I have seen on which VPAT domain where are the clients coming from in the world and for the Danish domain .dk there's obviously see um, a lot of traffic from Denmark but to my surprise why is there so much traffic from Russia and Ukraine to the Danish domain and then there's a big jump down to Germany. So it's a bit odd there's so much traffic for the for that on the DK domain. And the uh, dot uh, Vegas domain on the right. Yeah of course the United States would be there but all the other domains it's a mixed order of why they have the dot Vegas. So when Windows machines today is connected to a network it will in the lower right corner in Swiss tray have a nice icon indicating it has internet access and, and, and is working. But in because I'm a proxy server that doesn't return anything and doesn't work by design the clients of course will show that they don't have internet access. So I found that uh, for this list of six Microsoft domains if I return the string OK for every request the client will indicate this has good internet access. So I just added a rule to the proxy web server function saying if you see this domain respond with OK and all the clients then suddenly indicated they have good internet access again. So what type of traffic do I see? Here's the types of requests I see and again of course I will see a lot of uh, get requests but I also see a lot of post requests so that's clients sending data up to the servers and then I got all the connect requests that's uh, the proxy traffic. There's 1.1 billion request for asking the proxy server to collect something. So that's actually clients that has downloaded the Yeva uh, proxy hack scripts and executed an, on the machine and then coming and asking for a web page. But also we see on the list there's WebDAO, there's Apple, there's uh, S Microsoft SSM client, there's uh, Microsoft VPN and there's many more I have not included in this. So there's a lot of different traffic in, the, in this. And that is based on the Apache log files. You can see in the lower corner about 470 gigabytes Apache log files with 1.5 billion requests in them. So it takes some time to grab through them and find the data. <coughs> so because I am a proxy server the client trusts and I have given them a configuration script. I have told them to send every data to my server including local traffic. So if you look here you can see an internal client as 1.5. It should actually talk to the same computer on the same network next to it 1.1 but because I have given it a script saying no you should ask the proxy server it's sending the traffic up to me and asking me as a proxy server even that they are on the same network. <coughs> and post requests, this is clients sending data. They are just posting data against a web server. Um, 37 million requests. As I don't have the data, I only have the logs, I don't know what it is. But it, everything clients sends to servers, so they could be confidential data, whatever documents, files, content, whatever. <coughs> And again because I'm controlling everything with my proxy scripts so every dot local traffic I have in the domain Ella from the clients it should never go to the internet because it's not resolvable on the internet. That's designed to be handled uh, to be used for internal network. So here we see some funny domains like Ctrix and Fileprint and vCenter and yeah where the client is coming up to my proxy server and asking for me to get that traffic. Because it's local I can of course not get the traffic but I can see what they are asking for. And then some years back there started to be a new smart function in the browsers because they want to protect the DNS traffic saying we want now to send the DNS traffic over HTTPS because then rogue guys man in the middle couldn't happen and they 
better couldn't control it. But because I'm now a man in the middle proxy server, I'm also controlling the DNS over HTTP. And it's basically just, as you can see here, a client asking for Baidu.com, and then it returns a JSON blob. So my proxy could return whatever I want, a JSON blob directing the client to go to another location or whatever. <coughs> So passing through the log files and looking for all the file extensions that is downloaded. This is some of them. This is the highlighted one. Uh, this is a bit scary to see all the credentials and certificates and there's the executables, there's database files, there's scripts so I could replace the script and if the client is executing the script on the machine, it's not a good thing for the client. Here's an example of executable files the clients try to download. So there's um, Windows Update Microsoft installer, there's antivirus updates, Microsoft SCCM client, and real player, and didn't know real player still was a thing, but okay. So there's a lot of different uh, requests here, and I get a lot of them. This is just a s small sample list. But the list of file names I found with the extensions is not fully true because I also found that there were some bad guys trapped in my setup trying to scan other servers. So they were trying to enumerate for different files like PFX files and other files. So you can see here there's a long list where they try to access a web server asking for different files and hoping that they find something. So credentials in the URL, there's a lot of them. I uh, get 200,000 URL requests with where the username and password is part of the URL. And I don't know if you can see the size of the screenshot there, but it's apparently an Indian guy that has a lot of friends. He is using a web service to send SMS uh, messages to all his friends. He apparently have a lot of friends. There was many, many log lines here. So they all start with dear something. Um, yeah, uh, I don't know what he is trying to do. So credentials, here's some of the clear text, non-encrypted credentials I just get to the server. And I have, uh, some of them is so ridiculous like admin, admin. I can, cannot censor that away. It, you should see it. And there's change me, change me. I think that's a good idea to change that one. Um, and security party, yeah, we are DEFCON. Security is a party. So, yeah, that's very crappy credentials. And NTLM version one shouldn't be used for the last 20 years, as Microsoft has tried to tell us, change to NTLM version two. So administrator, root, security accounts, and so on with NTLM version one. And then there's NTLM version two. I also got many, many clients sending the credentials. And there's some good usernames here, admin, administrator, doctor, hotel manager, and then a laser, that sounds fun to play with. Um, and SA, that's normally a system and Twitter account on SQL servers and likes. So many good credentials if you are malicious. So what is the client talking to this server? When I started this project, my, my thinking was this is just Microsoft crap. Um, they should patch the things. But if you look at the list, you can see it's basically everything, every application. It's VPN clients, it's antivirus applications, it's, uh, yeah, the list is very long. This is just some of them. There's Cobalt Strike. And you can see in the lower right, left corner, there's even some guy having trouble with his internet access. So he's using Wireshark to debug his network is not working because he's apparently using a proxy that doesn't return anything. So he's debugging that and I then get his uh, update check from Wireshark. Yeah. So the list is long. There's Proton VPN and many clients. In fact, I got 27,000 different user agent strings with Linux, Mac, iPhone, Android, 
whatever, all platforms. So now I cannot say which client it is that has the issue and which application that has the issue because it seems to be everything. Oh. Yeah. So when you're running an, a proxy server that doesn't return anything and you have clients behind it, there was some of the clients was not able to download so, some um, updated uh, background screen that the CrowdStrike provided to Windows machines. So I have actually protected 226 uh, machines from CrowdStrike. And about, what about detection? The only place I have seen any detection is when clients is behind a Palo Alto setup. The Palo Alto setup will monitor the URLs the clients is asking for and then try to categorize them and check them for malicious thing and so on, like many other proxy servers is also doing. It's the only one I have seen in the traffic that's interacting with the traffic. And the way it's doing, it is replaying the same request that the user tried to do, but it adding, adding this user agent string, this long string you see here, that's the, the complete string. So it's a pretty long user agent string where it says it's Palo Alto monitoring device and so on. And it's suggesting I can send a mail to them to get whitelisted. But again, I'm a proxy server and I'm not the destination, so it's really pretty, pretty many mails I have to send to them to get whitelisted for everything. So I haven't tried that. And then Cisco apparently has some kind of uh, endpoint client you can install on computers. And I, it's my understanding it is designed to protect the client from rogue DNS servers and rogue proxy servers. Um, it's not working so well. Because what happened is, because I'm returning error pages to everything and rejecting all traffic, the client in, and the client machine, the application seems to get angry and just making brute force against my machine, trying to loop and getting the request again and again and again and again, again and trying. So the only way was I had to make a black hole for the domain. So I just discarded everything with opendns.com into to a null and didn't reply on it. And then the Cisco client stopped DDoSing my server. Yeah. So I have also found what I think is malicious. This is uh, for the domains engineer, exchange, exposed software, and so on. There's a VPAT script. And it seems to be uh, running a proxy for HTTP and FTP traffic with the fail option. So if it doesn't work, it will go direct. But it's also collecting data and sending it over an extra channel with some communication. So this looks like someone is monitoring traffic for this uh, four domains here. And this, this one is a bit weird one. Um, it's a, I think it's either it's a guy that really, really like ads or it's, it's just a, some testing going on because on vpad.trade, there's a proxy script that's looking with a lot of if statements. If there's including some kind of ad word in the request, it will send the request through a proxy server. If there's not a word, then it will go direct. So it seems that someone is trying to collect all the ads. The reason for this, I think, can maybe be that he is replacing the ad IDs in the traffic to his own, and by this, earning money on capturing the traffic and then getting paid for the, because he's directing all the clients to his ad ID, maybe. Or it's a test for something. Or he's just like ads. I don't know. So here's another one, also a bit weird, and the name, the TLDs, the dozen MR cooking storage surf, there's no, no uh, continuous line in them. Um, it claims to be some sort of security project. I haven't been able to found, or find any place where they are talking about this project and anything, so it's only a claim inside this configuration file. It's, 
it's a bit weird in it's only sending the traffic to a proxy server for what is not resolved of domains. So all, all the things that failed, it sends to the proxy server. Anything else, it goes to direct. So it's maybe something that tries to look for all the odd things that's hidden on the net. I don't know what the function is. Yeah. So we have a winner. Apparently, press is more interesting than porn. I wouldn't have guessed otherwise. But uh, this is the score for the vpad.dat file, how many times it downloaded. And they have been running at the same server, same time, for the same. So from the client, from the forms I get with the users, I got 40 users that clicked they want the whitelisting from this error. Even I haven't implemented any function to whitelist anything and I'm just returning errors to them. And they insert some computer names. It doesn't look like DNS names, but it's computer names. So, yeah, maybe a day I will add a whitelist function. And here we have some feedback from the users. <laughs> Apparently, they are not all happy. Some users say I got this error message when trying to get to my net bank, or I clicked this link in the mail and got this error, or t shirt, or whatever. So, not all users are happy. So, when I saw that I was getting feedback from the users, so thinking, why not set up a survey asking the user how much they like my non non-working proxy server that only return errors to all the clients. So I added this uh, three normal steps that could ask. And to my surprise, I have a higher leaning on, they really like my service and would recommend it to their friends. So <laughs> this is for a non-working proxy. <laughs> but there was only four responses, so. Yeah, and there was no one submitted an email, email address, so the $100 is going to Danish cancel front. I added uh, on, the, on the web page, I added a feedback form, maybe getting some good suggestions and so on to what I can improve on my non-working proxy. But uh, I only got more than 3,000 spam messages saying that they will uh, ECA you optimize my website so more will find it. I don't know if I should sign up for that. I have many clients already. Um, and zero feedback from anyone. So for the period of this one year, I monitored it uh, via by Google. If anyone anywhere was writing about this domain I had on my list to see if they was talking about it in some forum, uh, talking about disabling VPAD and so on. Um, I haven't found anyone for one year talking about anything about the domains. So it has been, to my knowledge, completely silent for one year without any detection anywhere. So my question is, why can a dude like me even buy this domain? Why should this crap that's 25 years old not be just disabled? Why do we have this? It's not, it's not modern security model. We just download a, a pack script with a JavaScript, run it on the client, and then the client just sends all the traffic to a proxy server. It's not very secure. So I don't know if I can stand here in 25 years or in a wheelchair talking about the same thing once again, saying that nothing has changed. I don't know. But it is 25 year anniversary. Yeah, I can see I have still some time. So first of all, a big shout out to my friend Kel Norman for a lot of help with the research and, and information. And I have some bonus slides because I have some extra time. So I posted this, uh, this talk was uh, on the schedule page on DEF CON. And shortly after that time, I was contacted by a guy that's called Teton saying that uh, he was for the last half year basically doing the same research into some other domain names and we could look and share some data 
that could be fun if we had the time. Um, but also he's had paid up for some domains in the .80. And from what I've heard, there should be a coming a really, really good talk. I look forward to hear how many Active Directories there's uh, coming in the same way. Okay, 10 minutes. So after running this for basically two months, I got contacted in Denmark. Denmark is not a very big place, about five, six million people. Uh, so the security community is not that big. I got contacted from someone saying, Thomas, is this you running some kind of research project for the VPAT? Yeah, okay. This big company apparently got a lot of machine trapped in the VPAT that file and all the traffic was going to my server. So they, they just wanted to know and the way they found it was because uh, one of the domains I had on my list, it was not fully uh, anonymized. So they could see the name Thomas and then they say, ah, Thomas from Denmark. Then we, we tried to call him. <laughs> That's good research. Yeah. So if we're looking back on 27,000 different user agent strings on basically all platforms, I would like to present one slide saying this is Microsoft crap. Here's the three settings you want to set on a Microsoft machine and you're protected. But this seems to be all platforms, all applications that has the issue. Otherwise, I wouldn't have got so much traffic as I've seen in my data. So my best advice is to add into the host file on the machine uh, the VPAT domains and saying that it's a loop back to itself so it will never send any traffic to the internet. And then you have to look up uh, each OS, see which way you can disable the function on there. And also add the VPAT to your company domain. So if a client is asking on that domain, it will not uh, uh, resolve other than 127. A thing also to note here that I skipped over is that when a client download my VPAT configuration config file, it caches the file. So when people are working from home, they may be on a network where they can download the file in a, in a DK domain. They download the file, start using the proxy, get into the workplace, keep doing, using the proxy because they're caching the file. I am told them to use this file for 14 days or something. So they will keep using it. Um, yeah, and it's best to disable this uh, VPAT function at system level, otherwise it, you will, if you only disable it in the browser, all the services you have on your machine that are running at system, they are also talking, like antivirus application, they are talking to the internet. That will not inherit the configuration from the client settings. So it's best to set it on machine level so it's everything on the machine and disable its function. And as you can see, there's a Windows service called HTTP Windows Proxy Automatic Discovery Service. It's on all machines. No one know what it is, but now you know, know what it is. It can be difficult to disable because it has dependency to other things. Um, yeah. So basically read the fucking manual to find out how to disable it on all applications and OSs. Because it's not easy to, for me to make one slide that fixes it all. Yeah. So this is the slides. Again, thank you to Kill.